So the message is, I'm ready, the cooling of desire. The cooling of desire. The fall of mainstream Christianity. Read with me, if you will. Uh, does it seem like there's a glare on that to anybody? Looks all right? Okay. All right, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, down to verse 5. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened. And when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Dear Holy Father, we do pray for your blessing upon me, and ask God for your blessing upon those that are here today. Thank you for the Holy Bible. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. In Jesus' holy name, amen. You may be seated. Well, the first question we have is, what desire is he talking about here? We have a picture of the drawing to a close of a person's life right before death. And the Bible's saying, use every day that you have and serve God with all your might. And um, he mentions some things here. Uh, your eyes, your ears, uh, your sense of balance. Uh, and he says here, desire shall fail. And the question is, is what desire fail? We also see this as a picture of the end of the age, where in the last days, Laodicea as the seventh church period in the book of Revelation, God said in the last days there will be a falling away first, and they will not endure sound doctrine. And so we see this as not just a statement that we need to serve God every minute, before the grave, but also we need, to t we need to understand what age we're living in and not be a part of this closing of Christianity. We don't want to be part of this shadow. We don't want to be part of those that are losing their desire in these last days. I pray you will be the faithful remnant and you will be stirred up and renew your youth in Christ. Amen. Renew your strength in Christ. And let's wait for his coming. Now most um, commentators, it appears, take this desire for what we might call venereal desire, matrimony desire between a husband and a wife. I've spent a lot of years talking with many aged men, some in their 90s, and uh, they all tell me that such desire does not really fade. Uh, and uh, These were healthy men, I admit. They abstained from alcohol, uh, nicotine, and they were more health conscious, and really the more health conscious they were, the less they said that this desire even faded. Um, I believe it's talking about no particular desire in general. It's just talking about uh, some of the pleasures of life can become difficult to enjoy, and really that's what it's uh, referring to right before natural death. Uh, when this exactly occurs, to whatever degree, is relative. In this age, it's, recurring, it's occurring a lot earlier. Remember, Caleb, when he was over 80, said, I have the strength that I had when I was 40, and he went and proved it. Some commentators say he was just boasting. No, he went and proved it. He wasn't living in the time of the early patriarchs, so to speak. Uh, but yet, at the same time, you will find others in the Bible at various ages with their strength decaying. And so it's a very relative thing based upon a lot of things, your genetics, God's providence, ultimately, and as well as how much you will live in a healthy way and renew your youth by taking advantage of the good things God has for you. Um, let me give you a few examples of the relative nature of this. Let's go all the way till the time of the kings. We're in 2 Chronicles 24. And it said, but Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died, and he was 69 years old when he died. Does that say that? No, he was 130 years old when he died. So don't give me anything about, well, that's back when Abraham lived. Don't know. Uh, 
geneticists right now today says you should be pretty much leaving the place at about 120 and in your DNA, in your genes, it's coded. We don't understand why you're decaying so quickly now. And so 130 years old. But nevertheless, you have another fella. He was 80. And uh, we don't know how he lived his life, but it says, Barzillai said unto the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king unto Jerusalem? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my lord the king? So he was in uh, a little rougher shape than obviously Jehoiada or anybody else. But um, really... He wasn't that bad of a condition. But he's referring to this idea that some of the desires uh, as you get ready to head to the grave are going to disappear. Now, nevertheless, the revised version came along based upon some corrupt manuscripts that Satanists call the greatest manuscripts, the greatest books ever in the whole world. We as Christians reject these manuscripts, Sinaiticus and that type of thing, as corrupt garbage from the Gnostic Christians. But nevertheless, these have entered Christianity in what's called the Revised Version. If you want to know what kind of men Westcott and Hort were that brought you the Revised Version, read my book, The Word, God Will Keep It, and I will show you the necromancy, the seances, the praying to the dead, the evolution, the, the liberal ideas where they said if anybody really knew what we believed, they'd reject our new Bible, you know. But anyway, this Revised Version, we don't need a Revised Version. We need the authorized version. We need the good old faithful book that served this world well and serve God's people and it's got it's stained by blood stained by the blood of God's missionaries and martyrs and I'll tell you what I'm gonna stick with that book amen but nevertheless the revised version changed the word desire to caperberry I've been wondering for quite a few weeks what am I gonna do when I get here all right um, Let's look at the English Revised Version there in 1885. Not desire shall fail, but the caperberry shall fail. And really, uh, the New Living Translation, uh, they're following the old Catholic Vulgate, by the way. The caperberry shall fail. Uh, the New Living Translation says the caperberry no longer inspires and... Uh, they don't care what kind of words they really use, you know. Uh, that, that's a big problem with modern Bibles. You wouldn't believe what's, what's in the pews of some churches in these modern Bibles. I mean, wow. Um, let's see. Uh, the Darby Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the New American Standard Bible, the 1995 update says the caperberry is without effect. So they see the caperberry as some type of a stimulant toward desire. The New International Reader's Version says old men will not want to anyway. So they have all kinds of crazy things that they're coming up with here. Um, the Message, the Berean Study Bible, and others are so insane interpolating the doctrine of signatures, I won't even attempt to quote them today. Uh, but this is what's in most churches that you're just not aware. It's there, you know. Uh, what I find interesting is how many versions are afraid to go down that road and reject it. I mean, the RV, the American version, was the American standard, but they, they just kept desire in the text. Even the NIV uh, kept desire in the text and, and, and that type of thing. But nevertheless, you'll have all kinds of new modern Bibles that change this to Caperberry. Uh, commentators have the same idea. Here's Barnes' notes. He says, desire, but it's literally the Caperberry which eaten as a provocative to appetite shall fail to take effect. And uh, many commentators are not sure whether this is an appetite for your meal or an appetite for your wife, whatever the case may be. Um, in defending the RV, one 19th century scholar argued, here's the reason why they want it to be caperberry. The incongruity of the juxtaposition almond, locust, saving grasshopper, and desire 
must have struck many a reader of the authorized version. The context requires a, con a concrete noun, the name of some natural object. That's Professor George Moore, the Journal of Biblical Literature. What does he say? He's saying, well, you had the almond, you have the grasshopper, why would you have desire, even though the word can mean desire, why don't you make it some animal or some natural object because we had almond and we had grasshopper? Well, I, I believe the fellow, sometimes these scholars just, you just wonder if they even read when they come up with argument. Your arguments might sound good sometimes, but until somebody comes and searches out your argument, maybe we shouldn't boast so much about uh, some of the things we stand upon unless you really know what you're talking about. Ecclesiastes 12, let's read it. And when they shall be afraid, well, that's not a concrete natural object, of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way. That's not a living creature called a fear. That's, that's not some type of fly. That, 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 that's something, that's an emotion inside your, your heart. And then you have a natural thing, the almond tree and the grasshopper, shall be a burden and desire shall fail. If you've got fear right up above, surrounded by two natural things that are pictures, why would you not close with another uh, thing that is not natural? So, obviously here, uh, when they shall be afraid and desire shall fail, this is perfect uh, in context that we are going in and out of um, natural, figurative, as he's done throughout this whole chapter. Uh, so what are these caper berries used by these versions and commentary? Capers are usually the flower buds that are harvested from a bush called Capera spinosa. It grows in the Mediterranean areas all over that area, including Israel, of course. So it was all over the place um, at the time. <clears throat> Now, although I don't believe the word should be inserted into the text of the Bible, ancient history of the usage of capers, including among the Jews, I think it's interesting and useful to you today. Um, let me take you to a verse. Well, here's capers, by the way. Um, you'll see them all over the place. They're used for appetizers. Uh, they're, they're used to... Uh, they're served with meat, that type of thing. It says in 1 Kings that he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. Now, I do believe they say how sad it is we don't have Solomon's scientific works. Uh, I'm sure we don't have all of his scientific works, but if you look at Psalms, uh, I'm sorry, if you look at Proverbs, if, if you look at Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, you'll find that although it's in poetic form, you have uh, all that you need of Solomon's scientific works, I assure you. And it's amazing, it's just because it's in poetic form, people don't realize that you have things dealing with your natural body, because the Bible's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And although the most important thing is your spiritual life, your eternal life, there is so much in this Bible about how to live and how to get fullness of life here and now. So you could trust that Dr. Solomon, the greatest scientist, has left you a manual. People are just so unwise and foolish, they don't realize they have it right here in the very Bible. But it says that he spoke of trees. That's the first point. From the cedar tree unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of some new categories, beasts, fowl, creeping things, fishes. So I believe that implies that whatever the hyssop is in the Bible, it is a tree. Um, it's interesting that many, uh, so many throughout history, have believed that the hyssop refers not to the mint, although a very useful plant that we call hyssop. Uh, there is also an ancient hyssop that they believe was the caper plant and was the caper tree um, that fits the context of wherever we see hyssop in the Bible. And there's a possibility that that might be true. Here is Arthur Stanley in Sinai and Palestine in 1864. He said, hyssop, the lasaph or asaph, the caper plant is what it is. The bright green creeper, 
which climbs out of the fissures of the rocks in the Sinaitic Valleys, and thus explains whence came the green branches used, even in the desert, for sprinkling the water over the tents of the Israelites. It was always used for sprinkling. It, it, it had a reed, it had a rod, it, it, it had a branch upon it that you could uh, sprinkle, and we see that throughout the Bible. Uh, we know David says in Psalms 51, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Uh, Spurgeon quotes quite a few folks. Uh, John Dunn's in Natural Science says hyssop. Between 20 and 30 different plants have been proposed, but no one of them comes so near the above requirements as the caper plant. It grows out of the wall. Its stalks supply both bunch and rod admirably fitted for the ends indicated. It has ever been esteemed in the East as possessing cleansing properties. Um, J. Forbes Royal loved to study the plants of the Bible back in the 1800s. He says, on the hyssop of Scripture, from the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland, he says that the hyssop must have been large enough to be suitable for the purposes of sprinkling, as in Numbers 19, that it must have been procurable on the outskirts of Palestine, that it was employed by the Greeks and Roman as a condiment, is evident from its mention by Apicius. Apicius. It's stated in that of Discoriades that there are two kinds of hyssop, the one a garden hyssop, the other a mountain plant. The latter is found on the mountain of the temple, that is of Jerusalem. I was led to what appears to me its discovery by a passing from Burkhart's travels in Syria, quoted by Mr. Kiddo. He describes it as a tree. It springs from the fissures in the rocks, and its crooked stem creeps up the mountainside, a characteristic description of the common caper bush, which is indigenous to these regions. When in Aleppo, Rowolf says in his travels, there grew also in the road and on the walls such plenty of capers that they are not at all esteemed. They take these flowers before they open and pickle them and eat them for sauce with their meat. We proceed now to show that capers were supposed to be possessed of cleansing properties. And he gives us a long list of ancient sources to show that the capers are purging or cleansing in so many ways. Uh, he quotes uh, John 19, that there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop, fixing it on a hyssop stalk of some kind, and put it to his mouth. It is acknowledged on all hands that the common hyssop is too short and too slender to be used as a stick. Some also of the ancient statements refer evidently to a larger plant that the common, than the common hyssop. Thus Josephus ranks it with the trees. Such any of the old caper bushes or trees as they are sometimes called growing in the congenial climate of Palestine would be able to supply. So what we have here is just many ancient sources that believe, uh, not ancient sources, uh, we have some ancient, but... Uh, we have sources throughout the ages that believe the hyssop was the caper, uh, and they argue that. Uh, John Hutton's Plants of the Bible says, Even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall, that is the caper shrub, is fitted for all the purposes mentioned in the scriptures. Now, whether or not the hyssop in the Bible refers to capers, uh, it doesn't change the fact that historically, Capers were used for purposes of encouraging various aspects of health. Uh, and, and they were used by the Jews in this regard. And they were used uh, in regard to the marriage relations for that type of thing, stimulating desire. Uh, we find studies uh, telling us the same in modern times. Um, the, earned, the Journal of Ethnopharmacology uh, just this month says, oxidative stress is one of the underlying causes of male infertility. We're decaying. We, we live in a bad environment with pollution and, and bad food. We evaluated in vitro effects of the, uh, the caper, the actual leaf extract. The antioxidant effect of leaf extract was six times greater than the fruit. Progressive and total motility of caper-treated groups were crucially higher than the control group. Viability in all treatments was significantly higher than the control group. They basically just said that um, caper massively increased, especially the leaf fertility markers in men. It was used 
for centuries by women for infertility, as you will see uh, in some of these studies here by Bailey, uh, etc. So whether women, whether men, they used it for infertility, and it was used that way in ancient times, and they're finding out now that there is some scientific basis in modern research for this being the case. When we go back to Professor George Moore in his Journal of Biblical Literature, he tells us that capers were so used to stimulate desire, we have explicit testimony of Arab writers on Materia Medica. And Delicius Kolef Winstein quotes the Medical Dictionary of Malaysia, what a physician must not be ignorant of. An assetuous tincture of its seed stimulates flagging venereal desire, restores it when it has ceased. So according to Weinstein in another Arabic medical dictionary, in the Sudan at the present day, the capers, a species also found in Palestine, a different species, plants of Syria, is regarded as a specific against barrenness, meaning it's used for infertility up in the 1800s and all down through the ages to basically stir up the appetite, to help you be healthy uh, in all of these ways. Uh, even in the Middle Ages, uh, Domenico Romali's Doctrine of Signatures quotes the caper as uh, useful for that purpose. Now, when you look inside the compounds of the actual caper, the, the, the ancient rabbis reveal various parts of the plants were used for food, whether it's the flower buds or the berries, and we've seen the leaves now contain powerful antioxidants. Uh, pa uh, capers contain huge amounts of quercetin, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory phytochemical. Quercetin, like resveratrol that you have in the grape leaves and mulberries, helps maintain testosterone levels in man. So in other words, what it does inside men is it blocks something that wants to change your testosterone and uh, into a different element in your, in your body. According to the phytochemical and pharma pharmacological properties of the caper from the journal Nutrients, it says flavonoid compounds such as rutin and quercetin are detected in the caper. So we're finding this out today. What we're finding is that so many of these things, when they just looked for vitamins, it has many, but what they're finding out now is it has these micronutrients. It has these antioxidants that are so super, and Bible food is full of these antioxidants, which you need just to keep you from rusting, to keep you from decaying, and to go in and repair the cells of your body and, and, and your brain, and all of that. So important that we get these, so important. And the Western diet is lacking them, see. In other cultures, at least in earlier days, it was, they, they ate their meat with the capers. You know, they ate all of these things together. And uh, we're losing the grape leaf and, and all of these other things like turmeric and uh, so many other antioxidants. When you look at the caper, it contains so many antioxidants and anti-inflammatory neuroprotective effects. A modern studies have shown capers linked to weight loss management, antimicrobial, anti-allergy. It even repairs and improves cognitive and learning and memory damage. At least in animal studies, when, when they've uh, given them oxidative uh, damage and messed up their brains, uh, they've given them capers and started seeing improvement. They contain things when eating chemically, uh, they actually clean your meat. Uh, when you're eating a clean meat, it helps the meat be healthy for your body. So, uh, the capers, uh, possibly in the Bible, I don't believe it's in Ecclesiastes, but um, it's definitely in history and something that would be very useful, I believe, for you. Uh, if you wanted to preserve your reproductive health or lead to better reproductive uh, venereal, uh, venereal health, if you will, uh, one of the best things you can do, they're finding out now, going vegetarian can lower testosterone and damage libido in men. Researchers from the University of Worcester add 
the male hormone testosterone protects against heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Results show vegetarian low-fat diets rank as the worst for a man's reproductive health, decreasing testosterone by up to 26%. There's a big attack on meat right now. And uh, I tell you what, try to get meat without all the nitrates and all of those chemicals. Try to get meat that's not full of antibiotics and hormones and, and, and fed, get from a cow or an animal that has seen daylight and eaten grass and that type of thing and drinking good water and, and, and that type of thing. So where you're getting your meat makes a difference to how healthy meat is for you. And also, let's try to use the things, these capers and other things, and, and eat our meat the way they ate it in a balanced diet. But we're certainly seeing today that uh, the idea of vegetarianism and staying away, uh, that's just going to destroy you in many ways. Uh, the Bible says you're free to do that if you want to do that. Uh, we, we might have to do that uh, when it comes to financial reasons and that type of thing. Uh, and the Bible says not to judge one another about that. But nevertheless, um, this is the truth. I believe, and, and meat leads to strength, uh, as we see. For centuries, there's been this idea that if a man eats in a way that lowers his testosterone, he can avoid temptation. So you will see um, many of the monks eating hops and avoiding mead and things like this. And they would eat all of these various things that we know now are estrogenic. In other words, they were actually getting rid of their maleness, you know, and these things are in all the perfumes and shampoos and just about everything you eat in Walmart today. Uh, maybe that's one reason we're having such trouble today. Not only the propaganda, but a natural agenda to cross uh, the sexes, if you will. Well, what happened with, with these monks, the Catholic monks all down through the ages and these Buddhist monks and all of these things? Well, what you find is they didn't avoid temptation, many of them. They became homosexual. And they preyed upon kids. As you could just type in right now what's going on in the Catholic Church. And they're saying, what, what is happening here? And, and so I do not believe getting rid of your testosterone is the way to try to avoid temptation in this modern world. Um, it's better to redirect your energy if you're single or go get married. But, but, but don't, don't try to basically transgender yourself physically, you understand. Uh, now, the early Methodists had certain things that they would avoid, and I'm not saying it's an entirely, um, there's some things you can watch in your diet to uh, keep from certain temptations, but in general, um, the goal is to try to be healthy and uh, focus your strength and your energy where it needs to be focused, in holiness and godliness and, and building things for God and, and that type of thing. Now there are numerous other herbs without harsh side effects used throughout the ages and confirmed by modern research that aid in all aspects of reproductive and venereal health. Garlic which causes blood flow in men and women, ginseng, amazing, uh, the secret, the, um, um, the scent of cinnamon, myrrh, all down. We see that in the Bible used in these ways, and modern studies show how this helps you. Why wouldn't you, as a married couple, want to have good hormone health? So, so many, uh, they, they're not healthy. Their hormones are, are just backwards and upside down. Why wouldn't you want to preserve good hormone health? I don't understand why. Why in the world you wouldn't want to study these things so you can be as natural and healthy as you possibly can be toward one another. And, uh, but, but yet we're just allowing modern diet uh, and pollution with, with nothing to try to stop it or counter it. And God has some wonderful things that you could do to preserve your youth and that type of thing. Uh, Pharmacology Review, I believe 2013, said the date palm, specifically the date palm pollen, dates were everywhere in the Bible, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in, in Israel, used upon their coins, is used in the traditional medicine for male infertility. 
Uh, in an experimental study, we investigated the effects of date palm pollen, and these results were affirmed. All this ancient idea that the date palm pollen is good for men and fertility uh, has been uh, at least affirmed by modern research. What a blessing. What a blessing. I'm not sure why people don't spend more time. I'm not sure why women don't study black seed to maintain their estrogen levels. And, and, and I don't understand why you don't study uh, things like motherwort and various other mints and, and take your spearmint and sesame uh, and, and all of these things that, that we know and, and just eat this biblical way with, with garlic and, and study some of these things. Um, what a bless! Do, do you know that th there's been times when, when I've been on the phone with somebody and I said, I'm going to pray for you in your marriage. You said, my wife hates me. She's throwing things all over the place. She, and, and I'm telling you, this has happened multiple times. And I said, well, go see if she'll drink some spearmint, spearmint tea. Uh, take some motherwort. And uh, today I would recommend other things. And, and I'm not telling you there's a pill you can take to help your marriage. But I, I've had men call me back after a day or so and says she's hugging me, she's sweet. And, 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 and I'm not telling you you can take a pill to solve your marriage problem. I'm telling you that you are part body. And let's get the body side straight. And a lot of times that helps decrease your temptations with the mental part of things and the spiritual side. Definitely get the spiritual thing straight. And you can have a good marriage regardless of what you feel in your body. But so many folks get out here and they're just letting the body go, go to decay. That they're letting this pollution and environment and agenda just basically ruin your life hormonally. And no wonder everybody is, is having so much trouble. You know, get out here and learn how to use some of these things. And what a blessing that would be to renew your youth. And uh, I tell you, you might find that it solves more problems than you ever thought that it would solve. You know, you need God, but God wrote you a Bible. He wrote you a manual, and He gave you some things in regard to food. Why we neglect this, I haven't the slightest idea. We got in this mess because Eve put something wrong in her mouth that was food. You understand it wasn't food. She thought it was good for food. She was wrong. Maybe you're sticking some things in your mouth that you think are food, but they're not good for food. Maybe we need to think of this out, you know what I mean, and study this. Our Lord Jesus, when telling you he's coming in the last days, and he talks about the stars and the moon and all of these terrible plagues coming. And he ends the whole sermon by telling you, so you better make sure that you are wise in regard to what you eat, lest you be filled with surfeiting and drunkenness and all of this come upon you unaware. Our Lord Jesus concluded his sermon about the last days telling you, watch how you eat. I don't know what the problem is. The problem is you've been messed up in your mind to think this is just a book for your spirit and it has nothing to do with your body and we're getting out here trying to live and the devil's having a field day in your life because of it. Awful quiet in here. Every now and then you can say amen. I'm not begging for an amen. But if it has something to do with the Bible and God, amen. I'll amen myself. Listen, let's move on. Some of you are like, yeah, finally. <laughs> let's move on. I want to close. Not immediately. But I want to close this last phase of this message by dealing with the prophetic picture. You see the lights going out. You see the sun, moon getting darkened. Well, that's relative to the aged man's eyes. But oh, looking at it prophetically, guess what? The sun and the moon, relative to all of mankind, gets darkened. And um, you see the loss of spiritual vision. In the last days, many believers will not be listening to God, the hearing. There will not be biblical balance. They will not, they'll be afraid of high places. You don't see Christians, you see Christians today being afraid and squeamish. And, and they won't get out here and preach in the gates and in the streets and proclaim. They're ashamed of the Lord's word. And he says, if you're ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, sinful generation, he's going to be ashamed of you. He said, whatever I, whatever I tell you in secret, preach upon the housetop. So what we're seeing is the decay, the falling away of Christianity, uh, much of it in the last days. And when the perilous time shall come and they will not endure sound doctrine, 
and God says there will be a falling away. Well, what do we see finally at the end? We see what? Oh, well, we saw that the grasshopper shall be a burden. We preached last week. What's happening with Christians today? They'll barely lift a finger for the Lord Jesus. It's such a burden to do anything. God says they won't even open a door for naught. In other words, they say what weariness it is. You know, oh, I tell you what, the slightest thing. Well, what about the trials, God? You get so easily offended, so easily upset at God because you go through a trial. You won't preach and witness because somebody is going to laugh at you or mock you. So, so uh, the world just barely has to say anything. And the modern Christians, especially the young people, many of these young people are alive and awake, but many are so afraid and squeamish. They don't want to be embarrassed in front of the world. They're so ashamed of their heritage. They're so ashamed of the foundation. They're so ashamed of their biblical Christian life that they've been brought up in. And, and they're just, the, the, the little grasshoppers are a burden for them. You can't get them to do anything for God today. But what is this last thing that we see? Desire will fail. Desire will fail. So what I do is I just go through the scriptures, plug in the word desire, Find out what desires are going to be failing in these last days and let's look at our life. Let's look at our church and let's hope that it's not failing in here, in, in your family, in your life. Amen? What desires are failing? It says that when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and this apostasy and this falling away, the desire of God's people is going to fail. I don't want to be part of that crowd. All right, Nehemiah 1, O Lord, I beseech thee. Let now thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. Oh, God said, I believe prophetically in the last days they will not desire to fear his name. Not only do they not fear, there is no desire for more fear. If you ask me, you want to fear God more? Oh, they don't want to fear God more. Do you want to reverence God's name more? Oh, they don't want to reverence God's name more. I cannot believe what happens. The, the, the movies, the comedians, the music they listen to, taking the name of the Lord Jesus in vain, and you keep watching it. You keep having fellowship with people that take the name of our Lord Jesus as a cuss word. Can you believe? Call him a wizard and call him all kinds of things, cussing our Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you, and uh, we sit there, not, not we, but... But this modern churches have fellowship with blasphemy of our Lord's name. No, why don't you desire to fear God's name? Why don't you desire the fear of the Lord? You're not, they're not going to desire to fear God in the last days. No, 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 no. It says in Psalms 145, He will fulfill the desire of them that fear Him. Why don't you desire to fear God if He gives you many of your other desires? Some of your, not all your desires are bad. Don't you want some things from God? I tell you, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and, and all these other things will be added. Why don't you want to fear God? If you read this psalm, doesn't that make you want to fear Him? I want to be one of those that fear God, so He will give me these other desires. You ought to desire to fear God. He also will hear their cry and save them. It says in Proverbs 3, Wisdom is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou can desire are not to be compared unto her. And what is the beginning of wisdom? What is the foundation of it? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Why don't you desire to fear God? Why don't you desire to have the very foundation of wisdom? If somebody preaches on the fear of God, you watch how people bow up. You watch how they run. You watch how they want nothing to do with the fear of God. God help us. It says in Job, Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. You know what's going to happen to God's people in the last days? They're not going to desire the knowledge of God's ways. If you have a church that's preaching God's ways to run a family, God's ways to live, God's ways to eat, God's ways to be. They don't, want, they don't want a knowledge of God's ways. They want their ways. They want the way of the world. And I tell you, we're living in a day and age when desire is failing. Desire is growing cold. It's growing cool, if you will. They do not desire the ways of God. But he said, I'll send you preachers that'll tell you, seek the old paths. Go after the old paths. But he said, in the majority, they're not going to listen. And God says they're not going to have rest then. They're not going to have rest. And I tell you what, many believers today, many raised in good homes and churches, have little desire for the Lord's ways. 
don't you want to know what God says about fashion? Oh, no. No, don't you want to know what God says about family, about being a wife, being a husband, being a child? Don't you want to know what God says? No, oh, they have no desire at all. And my question to you today, why don't you desire? Why aren't you hungry for the Lord's ways? Why? They sure are curious about the ways of the daughters of the land and the Sodomites. I believe they think they can get the best of both worlds. They can live in worldliness and still have the kingdom and all the blessings, but it doesn't work that way. Many have learned the hard way after many years of scars right before death. And as you know and I've reported, many of them have called me right before death and told me I've never known happiness except for those times I was serving God. I tell you what, all of this flirtation with the world, but you think you're going to be different. You think your gamble and your flirtation is going to be different. It will not be different. If you get the chance, you'll make the same phone call. But many will not get a chance. I can give you a list of them that died while they were partying, and they didn't get a chance. First Chronicles. Psalms. Where am I at? We'll find it somewhere. Oh well. Let me give you a verse. Psalms 27. One thing have I desired of the Lord. Well, we better get this straight, right? That will I seek after. See, when you desire something, you ought to seek it. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Children, I want to ask you something. Is that a desire that you have? That you could be in God's church all the days of your life? Or are you just itching for the opportunity to flee and get away from fundamental Christianity? Oh, you're just waiting for that day. Oh, whenever the devil dangles that little carrot or whatever it is before you, there you go, running after it like a racehorse. See, you know why? Because you never desire to be in God's house. And I'm going to ask you right now, why don't you desire? Why, why didn't your prayer? Because if you desire something, then you pray about it. One thing have I desired. Why can't you say with the Holy Spirit through David? Why can't you say the one thing, God, one of the main things I desire, Lord, let me dwell in the house of the Lord. Let me just go on up from church, and when you come, just be in your temple here at the coming. Lord, I just want to be in fellowship. Wherever you're being proclaimed, wherever your fear is, wherever your people are, that's where I want to be, not the worldly crowd. Because you said whoever's a friend of the world is an enemy of God. I don't want to have part of that crowd. I want to come out from among them and be a separate, touch not the unclean thing, and I want to have fellowship, and I want you to receive me, God, as your son and your daughter. Why don't you want to behold the beauty of the Lord? Why don't you want to be in a place that preaches about holiness and, and truth? And, and I don't understand why this desire to be a prodigal and take off so you can go live among the harlots and the heathen. I don't understand it. But yes, I do know the prophecy said, desire shall fail. I didn't have to look hard to find a couple of scriptures that show the thing you ought to desire is the fear of God. And the thing you ought to desire is to dwell in the house of the Lord. You know what the house of God is? Uh, the Holy Ghost, I tell you what, He's not going to let you out of this thing. He, he gets over the New Testament and He says the house of God, the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He tells you plainly the local church is the house of God. Do you get it? Why don't you want to dwell in the house of God? And you better start right now, young person. You better start desiring to be around God's people and around God's preaching. And if you don't desire it right now, you won't be like that elder brother. You'll be like that prodigal. And as soon as you get the chance, you'll be out of here and you're going to get hurt for it. You're going to get hurt for it. You say, well, I can't control I can't control how I feel. 
Really? It says in 1 Chronicles, moreover, because, David said this, I have set my affection to the house of my God. I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God. He says, not only have I funded the house of God financially, I've set my affection there. The reason I take care of it financially is because that's where my affection is. The church, not the Boy Scouts, not some other institution, the church. What we're doing right now, the church, is God's institution. He set it up. You may say, I don't understand what we, why we sing and preach and do all those things. And I, I tell you, God set this up. God set it up. He set up the public. Do you understand? They went into the synagogues. They, they, they would read the scriptures. They would preach. They had a leader of the synagogue. They, they, in other words, Jesus grew up in church. Jesus grew up in synagogue church, and he established his church where Jew and Gentile can meet together and be saved, and they can worship God. The church is God's institution, and the Bible says your affections can be changed by what you think and by what you do. You can set your affection. And I, you say right now, I'm cold in regard to the church. I'm cold in regard to fundamental Christianity. Well, the world has made you cold. Your heart, the flesh makes you cold, but you can set your affection. You can set it. Why don't you learn to desire church, brother? Why don't you wake up and learn to desire the fear of God? Why don't you wake up and set your affection on the things of God where you start liking it and when you come to church nobody's having to drag you you get here and you're full of thanksgiving you can't wait for the public preaching and the public worship and the public testimony and the public fellowship why don't you get excited about it and set your affection I tell you you think you're going to be you say well God I didn't like it like that's an excuse I don't like my husband I don't like my wife you know how many men have told me well I just don't love her no more I said, it's a bunch of baloney. You get your butt home and learn how to love her. Love is a command. The Bible said the aged women ought to teach the younger women. Teach them to love their husbands. Don't you tell me you can't set your affections. You can certainly control what you do, and you can control what you like. It's an indirect thing. But whatever you think about, the old devotional writers from C.S. Lewis to Finney all the way back said, you know, whatever you think about, is going to be what you feel sooner or later. That's why you want to lie about your husband, lie about your wife, you want to keep things from her, you'll start hating her. So you want to deceive your daddy, you'll start hating your daddy. The Bible said the lying tongue hates those that are afflicted by it. Even the pagan Romans knew that. They knew that what you do and what you think determines how you feel. Oh, stir up good feelings is what I'm trying to tell you. Stir up good desires. Stir up good affections and learn how to love God and have affections for God and for His house and for His people and for His truth and for His Bible. New Testament, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. But First John says many are going to appear in shame, in shame. See, I want to appear with the Lord in glory. When he comes, I don't want to be ashamed of his appearing. And how we get that glory? Well, he tells you right here, set your affection on things above. Things above. It means follow Jesus. There's a city coming. See, our Lord's coming. Don't look at this world. The Bible says the, the God of this world, Satan, and, and the prince and power of the air, the children of disobedience, worship him. Say, you know, I can't wait for the Lord to come. I can't wait for Jesus to come and his kingdom to come. And I tell you, it's going to be a blessing. And I'm going to set my affection. That's what I'm looking for. Well, he tells you to pray every day in your prayer. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Lord, I want your kingdom to come. The whole book of Revelation ends with, Surely come, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. You ought to want that city to come. You ought to want the Lord to come reign upon this earth. Set your affection on things above. His delight, talking about the righteous man in the Psalms, is in the law of the Lord. Is your delight in the law? Do you delight in learning God's ways? You know, when you read the Bible, you say, that's just going to tell me something else I have to do. Why do you look at it that way? Why don't you look at it as a privilege, sister? Why don't you look at it, wow, I'm going to learn something more about God. It's going to bless me in so many areas. 
Maybe that's why I'm not getting blessed in a certain year. I, I, I found something else in God's Word that I could do that will draw me closer to Him and maybe fix something so I'm not out here on a bumpy road. Why don't you get excited about living and about living to the fullest in his law he doth meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Oh, man, I, I don't know why you're not delighting in the Lord. Why aren't we delighting in the Lord? Why aren't we setting our affection upon the things of God? It says in Psalm 37, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Delight. That's the fullness of desire to have pleasure. You know, a lot of people don't want to go to church because God's preached. A lot of people, they say, I feel the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't want to be in that. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be in the presence of God publicly in His church. They read devotions in their home at the table and you're reading about it, and there's kids that say, boy, I can't wait to get back to my computer game and get away from Dad's preaching. I can't wait to get out from... Why don't you thirst after God and His way? Praise God, at 12 years old, our Lord Jesus, as our model, was talking to the scholars in the temple. Isn't that something? You saw where His desire was. He grew up a carpenter. He knew how to get out there and work, but he had a thirst for the Scriptures because he was God. And he was giving you a model of what to be. A young, I, I tell you, you get 12 years old, you ought to be interested in Scripture. You ought to be asking questions. It's time, at 12 years old, if you're not asking questions and you don't care about the things of God, something's wrong with you. Even the Jews had a bar mitzvah, whatever it is, that said, you know, at 13, it's time for you now to start seeking after God and having a relationship with Him. I'm not saying you can't have one at eight. I'm just telling you, when you start getting to be 12, 13 years old, buddy, they used to go out in the woods and cry out to God and say, Lord, I need you in my life. And that would, that would happen in the 1800s. I want you to wake up and start getting a thirst for God, brother. A thirst for God. Start loving God because the Bible said that your generation desire would fail. And when you see the sun going black and you see earthquakes and you see chaos, that there's going to be a desire that will grow cold. Even our Lord Jesus said the love of many is going to wax cold. It's going to wax cold. What about this one? Mark 11, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Do you desire anything from God? Then pray to God, and have faith in God. And let's start seeing some results around here. Let's pray for one another and start seeing some results. Say, I believe. And you say, well, how can I believe God will do it? Well, the only way you can believe God will do something is if He says specifically in the Word of God He'll do it, claim a general promise, but also, is God able? Is God good? Well, that'll give you some faith, right? So if God's good, and how many times did He say, do you believe I'm able to do this? See, He wants you to say, Lord, I know you're able, and I know you're willing. And be like that woman that wouldn't accept no for an answer, no matter how much she was insulted or ignored. She kept coming and saying, I know you're good. I know you're going to hear. And she had faith. And that's what God wants us to be. Why don't you have some holy desires and take them to God? Let's get some things accomplished for Him. Amen. That's exciting to me. Psalm 73, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Doesn't that convict you? The Bible said in the last days, desire shall fail. Why aren't we panting after God? Do you want God? God says, if you want me, draw nigh unto me, and I'll draw nigh unto you. But what you have to do is there has to be a separation from worldliness because you can't fellowship with God. So don't you desire God to come closer? It says in Job that the wicked say, no, I don't want God to come closer to me. But we ought to desire God. We ought to desire God. But notice it says, Proverbs 18, Through desire a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Intermeddle means to have fellowship with it. But a fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. So maybe you're out here as a young person. This is what you're doing. You just want to discover yourself. i got to find out who I am. i got to find out what I like. I, gotta, I know what they've taught me in my church. i got to find out what I am. i got to find me. Me, me, 
I tell you what, that's a bunch of baloney. That, that's a bunch of nonsense. You understand that? That's a bunch of nonsense. What you need is what God gives you and what God wants you to be and the person God wants you to be. You quit with all that nonsense trying to find yourself. That's not wisdom. Seeking yourself, trying to find out what I want, what I like. You're going to like whatever the stinking world tells you to like. That's what you, you're not an individual. I tell you, you want to go do all that stuff to yourself because the world told you that. You got that from the pop stars and all this stinking nonsense out there. That's where you got that mess from. I got to find out who I am. No, you got to find out what the communists want you to be. That's what's out there. They got an agenda, buddy, and so does Satan. So you say, all right, how do I get this wisdom then? I want to intermeddle with wisdom. I, I, I want to have wisdom and fellowship with wisdom. Well, you got to seek it. But you'll never seek anything that you don't desire. And if you desire it, separate and get around the people that can give it to you. Amen. I'm telling you something, folks. If you want wisdom, come to church willing to learn. <laughs> get in church. Come to church so you can hear and learn. Get around God's people. Call them up. Study the Bible. And turn the stinking wisdom of this world. Get it out of your life. Separate from it, okay? I'm not going to preach all day on that. But I'm telling you, you need to have a separation if you want to be wise. You got to desire it. You got to thirst after it. And you got to separate from whatever's keeping you from it. There might be people in your life that are keeping you from growing in God's wisdom. And you know who I'm talking about. And the Bible says if you desire God's wisdom, it's time to separate yourself. It's time to separate yourself from those that are keeping you back and making you a fool. God forbid that we in this church raise a generation of fools. I tell you, we're trying to do everything we can to raise some people and some young people that are strong in the Lord and not fools. Don't you let somebody come. Don't you love nobody better than Jesus. Don't you love nobody more than Jesus. Don't you love father or mother more than Jesus. Don't you love some pop star more than Jesus. Don't you love anybody or any friend or any relative more than the Lord Jesus. Or you cannot, you cannot be the Lord's disciple. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We don't have any desire. You don't have any desire. You don't have any desire for the word. They don't want to grow. Oh, praise God, there was one man that wanted to hear the word of God. Acts 13, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul. And what did he do? He desired to hear the word of God. But it said in the last days, they're not going to have desire. Maybe you did have some desire at one time. But maybe a sorcerer showed up. But Alamus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. See, whenever you're desiring as a young person to hear the word of God, a sorcerer is going to show up. A false prophet, a sorcerer, it's going to show up through whatever window you got open to the sorcerers. And if you don't have any windows open, they'll come chase you down. They'll come through your cousin, through your relatives. But there's going to get some sorcery, and that sorcerer is going to tell you, don't follow this. Be free. What did he tell to Eve? Be free, be liberated. I'll give you the true knowledge. Oh, but I tell you what, we need some man of God. Then Saul, which is called Paul, filled with the flesh, no, filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, Oh, full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the ways, the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. I tell you, what a great picture. Uh, because he's trying to take away people's vision, and now he's made blind. You say, what a mean thing Paul did. The Bible said he was full of the Holy Ghost. See, there's, there's fo folks, you need to pray. Lord, reward them according to their righteousness because they're in the way of good Christians. They're turning some good Christians and some little ones. The Bible said it'd be better for you to be dropped in the midst of the sea with a millstone about your neck than that you could, should cause one of these little ones to offend. I tell you what, it's time that you get some righteous, holy indignation and anger and say, I'm tired of people getting turned away from the faith. I'm tired of a bunch of sorcerers and false prophets lying to God's people and God's children. And I tell you, they need to be rebuked. And Lord, you need to do something to scatter them. I do pray they repent. 
But I pray also, Lord, you scatter them from those that are seeking because there's some kids in here. There's some young people. There's some people listening right now to my message that really do have some desire stirring up for the word of God and for the truth. And they say, I really do want to hear it. Folks, you better realize the devil's coming after you to try to take that seed out of your heart and try to snatch it away. And you need to watch for it. And some overseers and some people and some mature Christians, you got to watch these little ones and these wayward ones and these wandering ones. And you got to understand that there's some sorcerers, some elements out here that are trying to keep them from God's truth when they get God's desire in their heart. Hurrying along, let me tell you something here in Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire... And of course, if you've got a desire, you've got to have a prayer. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. The Bible said in the last days, desire shall fail. That God's people no longer have the holy desires anymore. One of these desires is right here in the New Testament. I didn't write it. The Holy Ghost did. Do you have a prayer for Israel? Do you have a prayer that Israel might be saved? Do you have a prayer? Is, you know, for 2,000 years and longer... It was prophesied by all Christians of all denominations, and it's right here in our Bible, that Israel would be restored in unbelief. Listen to me, unbelief. So Israel over there right now is in unbelief. Do you understand that? And the Bible says that God wants them to wake up and receive the Messiah. But they're either atheist or they've rejected a uh, many of them. That There is a great revival uh, by, by many in Israel. There's a remnant always. But we pray for a big prophecy to come to pass where Israel is awakened and they receive the Savior and then they go into the Millennial Kingdom and they're going to be head of the nation there in the Millennial Kingdom in natural bodies, many of them. And so I want you to understand that we ought to pray for the nation of Israel that they would be saved. You ought to have a heart for the nation of Israel that we don't accept the synagogue of Satan. We don't accept what they're doing against God. But we do understand. We got a Bible here that says that they're, they're going to awake. That they're going to go through the tribulation period. And after that, they're going to awake. And oh, what a blessing it's going to be. And I tell you, the gathering of Israel is Bible prophecy. Do you understand that? You said, well, they're in unbelief. Of course they're in unbelief. The Bible said at first they're going to have flesh and no spirit in them. But finally, you get down the road, he's going to blow and you're going to have spirit. Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, are going to be preaching there. I tell you, a lot of good things are going to happen there, a lot of bad things too. So let's get with God's program. The desires are failing right now. And you ought to have a desire for Israel. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They being ignorant of God's righteousness are going back to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And leaving aside Israel for a second, you ought, you ought to desire people to be saved. You ought to desire your loved ones to be saved. There's people that are under the law thinking that they have to work their way to salvation. They haven't understood God's grace. And I just wonder if our desire for soul winning in the churches has gone. Oh, you want coffee, cupcakes, and rock and roll, but where's the desire for Can we turn that air conditioner on? Where, where's the desire for, uh, oh, we don't have any way to turn it on, I reckon. Where's the desire for soul winning? Where's the desire? Can we open the door? Where's the desire for souls that are lost. I believe the Bible is prophesying that there's no desire to fear God, there's no desire for God's law, there's no desire for God's church, and there's not going to be any God, uh, desire for Israel to be saved. There's not going to be any desire for people to be saved. This is wrong, folks. This is wrong. The Great Commission said, go out into all the world, including Israel, beginning it with Israel, but unto all the world, and lead them to Christ. Have a heart for them. You say, well, they hate God. I, I know, you hated God. You hated God in some ways. You didn't want to hear the truth. We got good news. You, you know what, we, we have some bad news too. You're lost. But never let that take the, the, the place of the fact we got good news, folks. We got a gospel. Jesus died for your sin. I know many of them say, I don't have any sin. Okay, let's deal with that. But well, we got good news. Jesus is coming again and he died for your sins. Isn't that good news? 
Never lose your smile, folks. We got a lot to be angry about, but let's not lose the hope and the good news we have here. We've got a gospel. We're ambassadors of peace. God is making peace with you. God, in all of his wrath and anger, is making peace with you through his son Jesus. Be a herald of that good news. Amen? Wow. Believe me, I believe in old time hellfire thundering preaching for people that don't understand they're lost. But ooh, I got a good message, folks. I got a good message. Don't just major on the fact that they're lost. Give them the hope. Give them the hope. As concerning the gospel, Israel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, that is what God's going to do in the future. They're beloved for the Father's sake. Oh, my God. I tell you, the fact that Israel was restored in unbelief in 1948, wow. This thing's about to wrap up, folks. It's time for you to become a soul winner. Amen. It's time for you to become a soul winner. Isaiah 26, I'll give you a few more. We'll close. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me I will seek thee early. Why? For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Do you desire God's kingdom to come? Do you say, Lord, let your kingdom come? I'm tired of looking at all these rapists and what they're singing about and all the pop culture and all of the wickedness and the liars and the tail bearers and the adulterers. I'm tired of having temptations in my own heart. I I'm tired of the struggle. Lord, I pray you just come again and fix everything and reign. Uh, I'm tired of animals eating one another and gobbling one another up. Man, I'm looking for the kingdom. What a blessing. It it says, now they get out here, my boy and the other boys, they're out here killing snakes and stuff. Y'all better watch out with that stuff. And I'm going to tell you something. It says there's going to come a time when children shall play. Little children shall play with snakes, poisonous ones. They won't be poisonous no more. Isn't that something? That's coming in the kingdom. That's coming. We're going to have a beautiful kingdom that's coming to this earth. The Bible said Jesus will reign on earth a thousand years and then for all eternity. Book of Revelation. I tell you, it used to be when Methodist, Protestant, Baptist, everybody believed that the Lord was coming for a thousand years to reign on earth. And then after that... Uh, the eternal kingdom. The Bible said, desire will fail. And here it is. Desire is failing. Nobody's praying for God to come to this earth anymore. I'll give you a couple more in close. It says in 2 Corinthians, For behold, this self same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing over yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What revenge. In all things you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. They were allowing fornicators to be in church. And, and I know everybody's got to have a time when you lead them to Christ and teach them the way of God. You understand that. Everybody's got to be taught the way to live so they can grow. And, uh, and, and so, but, but they had it so open that all kinds of fornication was going on. And they were saying, well, we just want to be loving. And it was going on. We see that 1 Corinthians 5. Read about it. And Paul says a little leaven leavens the whole lump, and you're not helping this brother. You, you need to, 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 to be a little harder with him and, and put him out of the church so he can repent. Well, what happened is he ended up repenting. And the church ended up repenting. And this sorrow in the church and in that brother produced vehement desire for God and righteous indignation. You know why you don't have any righteous indignation? Because you haven't sorrowed for your sin. You're not ashamed of the coldness in your heart that you've had. You're not ashamed of the fact of loving this world and, and not hating sin. See, if you get down on your face before God and you have a revival, you say, God, I'm so sorry that I really haven't cared about sin. Oh, my. Then you're going to start having a vehement desire. Desire for what? Desire for holiness? Desire to fix whatever you had messed up. And it says vehement means violent, forceful, fiery. Why don't you have violent, forceful desire to get right with God and fix whatever's wrong? The Bible said in the last days, they won't endure sound doctrine. Desire shall fail. Desire shall fail. They won't have a desire to get right. No, not at all. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
Let us therefore as many be perfect, be thus minded. Do you desire to reign with Christ and be crowned? Do you desire for him to say unto you, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Why don't you desire that as your utmost? To say, yeah, I just want God to be pleased with me in my Christian life. I can't earn my salvation. I just want to love him and I want him to be pleased with me in my Christian life. And I desire to reign with him. I desire. Why can't you say that? Why isn't that your desire? Because you might be a fulfillment of prophecy today. You might be a fulfillment of prophecy. The Bible said in the last days, they'll not endure sound doctrine, it'll be a falling away, and desire shall fail. Your desire for holiness, your desire to reign with the Lord, your desire for well done, thou good and faithful servant, it's not there anymore. You care more about the praise of the world than the praise of God. I'm going to tell you, if you don't desire God and fill yourself with these godly desires, the devil will give you lots of desires to replace the good ones. The Bible said in Deuteronomy, Neither shall thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shall thou covet thy neighbor's house, or anything that is thy neighbor's. You've got a lot of this going on today, don't we? And not only, there's no shame of it. It said in Psalms 10, the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesses the covetous whom the Lord, they, they, they bless each other, they praise each other. One adulterer praises the other and everybody's like, there's no shame in it. They're not ashamed. We got some wicked desires going on today. Because what's going to happen is, if you're not going to stir up godliness, if you're not going to set your affection on the things of God, the devil's going to stir up wicked desires. I need to close by telling you one thing that's important. If you've got any more awakeness whatsoever, I'm going to tell you this and I'll close. Because you desire it does not mean that that is good. You understand that they are pushing a doctrine now that no matter how perverted your desire becomes, that that's some divine stamp of your individuality. And it's not just sodomy, homosexuality. It's moved into incest and all kinds of wicked things that, 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 that we don't even mention it. There are things going out there that they are pushing and they're all using the same thing. Well, it's just me. I desire it. And I can't change my desires. I can't change who I am. That's a lie from hell, folks. Amen. That's a lie from hell. That's not you. In one sense, it's you because we're all fallen. But the Lord made a new you. And that's the one he wants you to walk in. Yeah. And so that old flesh will still be there, but you're supposed to pray, God, I'll sure be glad when I get rid of it. So you say, well, I just don't like that. We ought to learn to like the things of God. You ought to learn to like the things of God. You ought to learn. Faith wire reports. Some pop star named Demi Lovato, I praise God I've never heard of her, or it, or whatever it is, explained during Appearance Tuesday on actor Drew Barrymore's talk show that she decided to cut her hair short, to break free. There's always a break in free, isn't it? The Bible said in the last days they're going to break free. They'll promise them liberty, but it's not going to be liberty. It'll be servitude. Oh, she wants to cut her hair short to break free of the gender and sexuality norms imposed on her by Christian and Southern culture. I tell you, there's nothing more mocked. It's been like this since the 70s, even before. Nothing more mocked than the Bible Belt or what used to be the Bible Belt. Nothing more hated and despised than godly culture that's so far from God now. But see, they keep mocking it, so it keeps running further and further from God. And when I cut my hair, Lovato explained, I felt so liberated because I wasn't subscribing to an ideal or a belief placed upon me to be something that I'm not. That's always going to be, no matter where you end up. Well, I can't be something I'm not. That's what the devil's going to sell you, brother. Y'all listen to me, young folk? Y'all listen to me? You even know what I just said? The devil's going to sell to you the idea that I'm just being myself. If I desire it, this is what I ought to be. I was trying to be something I'm not. 
During an appearance in March, the celebrity talked about coming out as a pansexual who was attracted to anything. Really, pan just means all. Well, this is where it's ending. You know, there's a god called Pan, some type of goat god, and really that's a good name for it, pansexual, whatever that is. But she'd basically say, I don't even know if she was ever a Christian or ever, but, but she did say, I left my culture. I left it because I'm liberated now, because I'm being me. The devil's going to take you further than you ever wanted to go. And his design is to pervert you and shame you and make an idiot and trash you. That's what he's going to do. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for folks enduring this message. We do pray, Lord, in all sincerity and love for you that you'll bring repentance right now, Lord, a desire to be clean, a desire to be pure, a desire to have pure desires, God. Let us cast down the wicked and let us set in us. Please help us with thy Holy Spirit and with thy church and with the reading of thy word to teach us to like things that are wholesome and pure, to not see how close to the world we can get, but to see how close to you we can get, Lord, to thirst and hunger after righteousness. Oh, Lord, we know you'll give us the joy and happiness and all the things beyond our greatest desires. Lord, I pray these young people, I pray, Lord, that they will not have a cooling of their desire, that they will not look and see what's cool by the world and have their desires for you squelched, Lord, quenched. We thank you, Father. We love you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.